that is a challenge. You've worked really hard like all year. I mean, it's work, right? Being in a wedding is work, especially if it's you're traveling work. for a wedding. Yeah, traveling, planning things, for, like the bridal thing and the bachelorette and ooh, it's work. <laughs> Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is a traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a Taiwanese-American marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my own all-natural skincare business called Chuan Skincare, that's C-H-U-A-N, and sharing my marketing tips on my blog, The Cultivate Method. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.so on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based out of Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm Filipinx American, and I'm a woman, and a lawyer by day and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. So before we dive into our mail, Nicole, can you tell us about your current sewing projects? I can. I am currently working on my first uh, family matchy matchy outfit for oh. me, my husband, and my dog. You, you can believe it. It hasn't happened yet. So uh, maybe you can tell me about what it's like to sew for your partner if you've done it before. But since I started sewing, I, you know, I get excited. I'm like, I'm gonna sew, gonna make you something. It's gonna be great. Would you wear something in this fabric? Nah. Would you wear something in this fabric? <laughs> It's nice, but no. I'm like, oh, the answer every time was literally no. No, no, no. <laughs> Even though like, I'm like, he'll love this. It's going to be great. He's going to love it. And then I found like a rainbow plaid that I've actually, it's from Joanne. And I've seen it on a lot of people on Instagram, all women. And I'm like, it's just really cute. And I just happened to stumble across it because it was sold out everywhere. And I said, hey, what do you think about this? He's like, that would make a really great shirt. I'd love a shirt like that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> 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 we finally got one. Um, and so instead of buying what I needed for a shirt, I bought eight yards and I'm like, we're making family outfits. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Two shirts. <laughs> we got it. We got to do it. Uh, so for him, I do have a Simplicity Mimi G pattern. It's um, an 820. Wait, it's 8427. So okay. Simplicity 8427. And it was the first pattern that was uh, released by Mimi G with her husband, Norris. And he's got a YouTube video uh, on, on making it as well. And I measured him and I was going to do all this grading. But then I asked him to give me a shirt that he really likes the fit of. And I was like, I should base it on this instead of mm. trying to contour for his body like we do. Uh, and, it, you know, I'm just going to make the shirt in the dimensions that he likes. And so I used the finished measurements and we'll, we'll figure that out. Zizu is my dog. He's a 23 pounds. He lost a pound since uh, he last went to the vet. He was at the vet on Friday. Uh, 23 pound Bichon Freeze, which is a, a bigger, this is a big boy. Um, <laughs> but I also had a simplicity coat pattern. Like I have oh. a couple um, that were, I have one, a hoodie from Ellie and Mac, but I do have a simplicity coat pattern. It's 9426. And so I'll just make him that coat. And for me, I'm going to do a shirt dress. Dang yeah. it. Um, I, I have so I bought fabric. I'm like, this would be a great shirt dress. This would be a great shirt dress. And I've never really worn shirt dresses because they've never fit me well, like with my proportions. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be great. And I have a lot of big four patterns. But mm. um, Ada, do you have any like indie recommendations potentially for like a good shirt dress or a shirt to like lengthen into a dress? Ooh. When you said that the first two that came to mind that I have are two big four patterns, but indie, there's the Helen's Closet Gilbert top, which is a collared shirt that I believe has been hacked into a shirt dress kind of just by lengthening, like you said, many times. I think Helen has a blog post on it. Mm -hmm. There is the, I think it's the Olia, O-L-Y-A by Paper Theory, who I think it's a longer dress shirt. And I think you can also lengthen that one. I'm trying to think what else. I actually haven't. I've made collared jackets before. I haven't made a collared. Uh, I've made like 
polos and stuff. So not necessarily like a button up Mm -hmm. kind of shirt dress um, from Indie Pattern Sephora. So I think, oh, Friday Pattern Company also just came out with one. She, her collar is a little bit different. It's like the Nina Lee Bloomsbury shape more, Mm -hmm. like thinner. Um, It's thinner than the Bloomsbury. Yeah. I think that's what it's called. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's thinner and kind of a different angle and I thought it was really cool looking but I bet that one could also be lengthened it just looks a little more tailored at the waist so you would have to either size up or grade out probably when you're lengthening the piece to make sure that it doesn't end up being like the width of one pan leg okay (laughs) yeah and I think um yeah I've seen the patina blouse it's really cute it feels good it's got a great 70s vibe to it but, oh, one more. Mm-hmm. Birgitta Hel... I'm going to say it correctly. Birgitta Helmerson mm-hmm. in in Malmo, Sweden. She does the zero waist patterns. She also has a collared shirt pattern and a workwear jacket, which I guess if you made in a lighter fabric and lengthened could kind of be similar. I like the zero waist concept, I think. I imagine that it's probably a straight cut and then strategically placed darts um, if for shaping, if necessary or needed or wanted. I, yeah, I will talk about it in, in a minute, but I did buy one of her patterns and she does not do a lot of those darts for shaping to keep with the zero waist. But if you know what you're doing, you could definitely alter the patterns to like shape in more or you could just like cut less fabric honestly based on on the cutting pattern okay well I'll take a look and you tell so what's going on with you Ada what are you working on (laughs) the reason I know how to say Birgitta Helmerson's name Mm -hmm. is because I pulled it up specifically for this episode so I have like three projects going on simultaneously number one would be the Woodland Dop Kits from Clumhouse that I am making for holiday presents. Ellie was on our subscriber sew and chat for a bit a few weeks ago, and I was in the middle of kind of sewing up the seams. It's really simple, super easy, and super fast. I think actually putting the leather bits on will take longer than it did for me to sew this Mm -hmm. and turn it out. Um, But these are going to be I was trying to think of like good batch gifts to make for um, some of my closer friends this year. And I bought two of her kits a while ago on the second sale and like they didn't look like anything was wrong with them. Full like transparency. Mm -hmm. I thought they came out great. So all that's left to do on these two testers is to attach the leather and then I will start cranking them out. Um, for the eight other ones I need to make. So I have two done. I need to make 10 total. So eight more. Wow. And then um, I do think once I kind of like get it down with these two, it'll be very, very speedy. I've got a jumpsuit twall that I'm not naming because it's not size inclusive, but I had cut it out last year before I knew anything about them. Um, and it's just been sitting here, like cut out <laughs> mm-hmm. for a year, basically since I bought the pattern and it's made out of an old target bed sheet that we used to have in the house. And so it's this really cool cotton with embroidery on it. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping it turns out well. It is white though. And the other day I was looking, I was like, this is a little sheer for my taste mm-hmm. in a jumpsuit. So we shall see. Maybe it will never leave the house. It'll be just a tall jumpsuit for home. You could dye and then it. The, I could. Oh, I could dye it. That is a good point. But the, the thread of the embroidery is black. So you could dye black <laughs> and oh, then that, it'd be like ooh. black with textures and then it can That's leave the house good, if you want it to. That is a good call. Perhaps I should start saving some things to do that. I'm like looking around my room. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that one I started the other day. I got the pockets assembled and then I sewed. You'll appreciate that I sewed the front crotch together and then the front pant legs together. And that's when I knew I had to call it a night. Mm. I was like, Mm, this is not a skirt it is a jumpsuit (laughs) gotta unpick all of that and the last thing that I'm working on that I'm really excited about that I definitely want to get done in time for the holidays because we're gonna go visit my in-laws is a Birgitta Helmerson zero waist coat so I bought that pattern and I'm gonna try to make the long version but I'm gonna try to make some alterations to squeeze it out of the long version calls for like 2.2 yards. I think I have like 1.75. Okay. And 
it's this really, really nice um, felted wool. I think I'm not exactly sure about it, but it's like coating wool and it's camel colored. It's the piece that I got from Fab Scrap when I volunteered there mm-hmm. and I got it for free because you get five pounds of material for free. And I am, I do have other wool that I've been sitting on and hoarding for a while, but like this one, I got it a few months ago and I just was like, oh, I've never had a coat made out of like such nice wool. And I was looking for something that I could maximize that yardage out of. And every other coat that I saw required like for something long, four to five yards. Ooh. I was like, yeah. you can't really, I don't, I'm not about to go and try and patchwork this. I know um, Ella, Handmade Millennial, made a cool like multicolor coat uh, a few weeks ago. I don't have the patience mm-hmm. or the time right now to go figure out like what other weight wool would match with yeah. this, which, you know, is, is kind of hard when you thrift things and find them secondhand, but I'm very excited because it's so nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I've not, uh, I've been intrigued by zero waste designs. I just haven't, I I bought a zero waste bag, um, which is really cute, but um, I have not taken the step to, although of course I want to, because it'd be nice to be able to utilize, you know, as much fabric as possible. And so kudos to you for, for going this route. And I look forward to actually seeing the final, the final product. Thanks. Yeah. It surprisingly... She points out a lot of different ways you can be zero waste and and things that you can do to change the pattern that would make it not zero waste anymore. Mm. Um, But I think surprisingly, it's a lot easier for me to look at the cutting layout because you get a cutting layout. You don't get pattern pieces. So that was another draw for me. You don't have to sit there and cut the pattern pieces. Yeah, Yeah, no taping. I mean, there's, there's about maybe five to eight sheets where they're curved pieces that you do have to you might want to cut out for ease of cutting Mm -hmm. in general but like five to eight pieces for a coat versus like I think the jumpsuit that I'm working on was a 60 page beast yeah because it was like full length pants and the whole thing and so to not have to do or to do that at like 10 percent of of what I would normally do on a pattern. I am very excited. It looks like it'll come together pretty quickly too. The only question is like, if I want to add a lining, which does make it not zero waste because you won't achieve zero waste cutting on the the lining. But yeah, that's the only question. Like, do I want to line it? I probably do. I think, (laughs) yeah. I mean, I would want to. Um, Yeah. That also saves you the step of having to finish all the seams with like bias tape. Oh, that'd be kind of nice. So you got that new bias tape machine that we both bought. And as far as I can tell, you haven't used it yet because I haven't. (laughs) I haven't because I haven't cut anything. Yeah, I haven't cut anything out. um, That needs it. That needs it. Yeah, this coat will be pretty low on. I'm not going to make bias tape out of wool. (laughs) um, But I have a lot of other stuff that's been cut out. I think I'm waiting to cut some bias tape from some of the extra fabrics that I have just lying around and it's like a good mindless activity for a day I also need to figure out how to to jerry rig my bias tape metal pieces onto the maker yeah yeah. (laughs) washi tape works okay but you could probably just go with like something more substantial like a masking tape and it'll be good probably uh we'll start at 52.25 And we're back. Surprise. At the end of season two, we decided we wanted to pop in for some reflection and sharing. So welcome everyone to our first mailbag episode. We have just wrapped up two whole seasons of the Asian Sewist Collective, and we couldn't be more grateful for our listener support and their feedback. So we do keep track and respond to feedback throughout the season, although we usually respond privately to the person submitting the feedback. Such is the nature of podcasting, right? So here's a little something you might not know about what happens behind the scenes. We batch record our episodes to maximize the availability eh, to maximize the availability of the hosts, and then things like that happen when we're recording and we're not editing that out. No, this leave time. it all in. 
we're leaving it all in. Um, but we batch record so that Nicole and I can manage our schedules better and hopefully help the producers as well. Otherwise, we would have to set aside time every weekend for episode recording. And so sometimes we will record an episode, get feedback for it, and not be able to actually address it until several episodes later because we, we will have recorded the episodes in between already or be working on them. And if we're at the end of the season like we are now, oftentimes it's just it's impossible. We've already released all the episodes. Right. So today, we're digging into our inboxes to share some feedback that we haven't surfaced previously, hence the mailbag episode. And as always, if you have any questions or feedback about our podcast, please email us at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram, which is at AsianSewistCollective. Right. So the number one topic of the majority of emails and messages we get are... Suggestions on topics to cover in future episodes. And we do, we love getting these emails and messages. I swear they make our lives so much easier because we're not the only ones coming up with ideas. And so we are super thankful for all of our listeners who are so committed to our podcast for their creativeness and willingness to share and just your openness to share your ideas with us on what you want to see. And unfortunately, we can only release 10 episodes or so per season, which means our small but very awesome volunteer team isn't able to churn the episodes out fast enough to make all of your wishes come true. But nevertheless, we do read every single message that came through and put every idea of yours onto a list, uh, also known as a backlog that's longer than a Joanne Fabrics receipt. If you've ever shopped at Joanne (laughs) Fabrics, you know, like you've only bought one thing, but you get all this paperwork. (laughs) Joanne has nothing. Joanne's has nothing on CVS. Oh, yeah. And anybody outside of the U.S. will be like, what are you talking about? CVS is a pharmacy here that literally for as long as I have been alive, prints receipts that are at minimum a meter long. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I, absolutely. And listeners, if you're outside of the U.S. and there's an equivalent, just share that with us so we can have a chuckle. What's your what's the longest receipt that you've received? That's just an insane (laughs) amount of length. Um, So. Ada and I had a chat offline about how to manage this long backlog and also, you know, keeping the podcast relevant and interesting to all of you. So we're going to start by sharing with you what our process is for selecting episode topics. And then we'll dive dive into some of the ideas that we've received for consideration for future seasons. Right. So how on earth does the Asian Solace Collective even figure out what topics to cover in an upcoming episode? And basically, it starts with a lot of planning. So before each season starts, the entire team, so there's currently about a dozen of us, gets together for a planning session where we discuss, vote on, and prioritize episode ideas together. The ideas with the most number of votes and the most number of people who want to work on them are the ones that make it onto our production schedule. And the other remaining ideas stay in our backlog and they're revisited again later because you never know, we might be interested in it, it might be more topical at another time, or someone might join the team who is interested in leading that episode. And And I find that this process makes it, I guess, a lot easier for us to keep everyone motivated and working on topics and episodes that they're interested in. Because like I said, there's currently about a dozen of us who are part of the collective and we're all volunteers. So it's, it's really what do we want to work on in our free time? Because this isn't a job and I, I never want it to feel like a job. And what do we as a group feel like would be useful and helpful and interesting to our listeners? So really, it is a group decision. There is a lot of voting and numbers involved. And if we do decide to move forward with a topic, then after we go through that whole process of literally going through the backlog, we will then begin the process of planning for those episodes. So this is really simplified. Like if I were to show you the spreadsheets and the forms and the polls involved, you would be like, wow, that's overkill. But um, essentially, I think because we're all living in different places and different time zones and we're managing it all on a volunteer schedule, this makes it super easy for us to figure out what episodes work for the collective and work for the team and Um, how we want to keep this podcast going. And then once we kind of get those episodes decided, we figure out who's going to do what. So when are we going to record? Who's doing research? Who's producing? Who's doing guest outreach, coordination, editing, all the other details, marketing. 
um, that go into putting together an episode for so you. In fact, if you want to have a bigger say in episode selection, you should consider getting involved with the Asian Sews Collective in season three. So for season three, we will primarily be looking for folks to help us out with audio editing, video editing, and marketing support, particularly when it comes to maintaining our Instagram account. So if you are interested in any of these roles or even just want to learn more, send us a message at our email at asiansoistcollective at gmail.com. And don't worry, emailing us isn't a commitment. Um, You can ask us as many questions as you need to in order for you to come to a decision. So next up for today, we said we're going to cover some of the suggestions that we received, and we'll also follow up on our thoughts and on the suggestions as well. So we recall we- <laughs> <laughs> it all in. <laughs> no edits. <laughs> we received a request to cover the experience of being mixed race. Katie Yap, who goes by at Yap Stitch on Instagram, that's Y A P Stitch, wrote to us a while ago, but also sent in a voice memo, which we will play for you now. Hello, Ada, Nicole, and everyone else at the Asian Sewers Collective. My name is Katie and my Instagram handle is Yapstitch and I'm a relatively new sewist living in Melbourne, Australia. I just discovered your podcast a little while ago and I absolutely love what you've done and the thoughtfulness with which you've done it. Your production is fantastic, your content is really well researched and presented and you have an amazing ability to fuse your clearly lovely personalities with strong statements about important issues. So I am half Chinese, half white Australian, and I've grappled with my cultural identity for pretty much as long as I can remember. Being Chinese is really important to me, but I had almost no cultural or language connection to my Chinese family, as my dad, who is the Chinese one, uh, he doesn't feel any affinity with the culture and he speaks only English. I also look really white, so many people don't even believe me when I tell them that I'm half Chinese which combines white privilege with sort of an increased sense of alienation. My cultural identities and the difficulties that I have with it, uh, it follows me to my sewing practice and I've been thinking for a long time about how I can express myself and my identity through what I wear and what I make. Thank you so much for giving me the sense of solidarity with you and other Asian sewists out there and for holding conversations that deal with things that I think about a lot, as well as many other topics that I've never thought about before. So I was wondering if you might consider doing an episode interviewing a mixed-race maker and how their blended heritage informs their sewing or their making practice. I would really love to hear the experiences of other halfies out there. That is a term that I use strictly endearingly. And I think that there would be many others who would also find it interesting and useful. Thanks for everything you do. Bye from Melbourne. So thank you, Katie, for writing in. And thank you for all of those really kind words. I am I was like, I, I read this email originally like a few months back and I was like, oh my God. But um, rereading it for the podcast um, gets me in my feels. The week after Katie actually emailed, we aired our episodes with Ellie of Clumhouse, so episode seven, season one, Ella um, at Handmade Millennial and Jennifer from Work and Social. And so Katie actually updated us and said she enjoyed them. So these three guests have all shared that they are mixed race Asian and they do identify with some part of their own heritage. And um, I think it's important to hear their unique stories and continuing to promote unique stories because they're unique. Everyone has a different experience, right? I'm sure Katie's experience living as mixed race in Australia is different. Um, Ellie, Ella, and Jennifer are all American. So I think it'll be interesting to see in future seasons how many other guests we can feature with different experiences all around the world. And I hope that we can provide a platform where these stories are shared so that every listener can find a story that they connect with and that resonates with their own experience. And representation is about seeing yourself in the stories being told and hopefully providing these perspectives elevates those and I think makes them more visible for those who may not um, see people who literally look like them or have backgrounds like them 
um, in the media today or in, in social media. And I guess the question is like, should we dedicate an entire episode to what being mixed race is? Uh, maybe. I think, you know, Ada, you and I are not mis- mixed race, so we don't want to be the voice of anyone who is. And I, I don't have a firm sort of opinion on it. I think, you know, what would the episode look like? And maybe folks who are interested in this topic can let us know, like, is it a series of interviews with mixed race soists specifically talking about their their heritages and, you know, what, what it's like navigating the world for them, you know, Uh, Katie mentioned being white passing. What does that mean? And, you know, I know that Jennifer touched on it uh, a little bit in her episode this season. And, you know, families' attitudes attitudes (laughs) toward being mixed race in their own family, their relationship to their Asian heritage. I think before we think about dedicating an entire episode to it, we do want to think, like, what what would this look like? And um, how would we best serve the folks who are interested in the topic? Yeah, I agree. I think it comes down to us hearing your feedback on like more of of what kind of episode would you want to hear this? Um, Do you want to hear from just more singular guests and have a deep dive with them? Do you want to have a whole episode kind of like this one where we pull in things from different people? Um, Or like the sorry episode where we had two guests um, who could share their experiences? Like, what does that look like? I think we could be always doing a better job of finding a variety of people within the diaspora, both in um, representing different heritages, but also, like I said, where they live, where they grew up, and their own lived experiences being so different. Um, and even, you know, someone's experience here in one place might be completely different um, than somebody else who lives across the country or in a different area of the country, or maybe who um, is different types of mixed race, right? So um, I think there's a lot to explore there. Another topic that we've been, uh, that has been suggested to us or just shared with us is covering the topic of Asian adoptees. So international adoptions, which is an adoption where a baby is placed with a family outside of its home country, have come under scrutiny over the last few decades. These adoptions, many of which were transracial, perpetuate white savior syndrome and imperialist views, basically that white people were saving foreign babies. So we thought it'd be nice to share some history and context on this that we found from an article in The Atlantic, so that will be linked in the show notes. And so the article says, and I quote, Starting in the 70s, single white women became much less likely to relinquish their babies at birth. This is speaking to the U.S. Nearly a fifth of them did so before 1973. By 1988, just 3% did. Single black women were always very unlikely to place their children for adoption because many maternity homes excluded black women. In 1986, an adoption director at the New York Foundling Hospital told the New York Times that though, quote, there was a time about 20 years ago when the New York Foundling had many, many white infants, end quote, the number of white infants had, quote, been very scarce for a number of years, end quote. Still throughout this era, American families adopted thousands of infants and toddlers from foreign countries. In the 50s, a mission to rescue Korean War orphans sparked a trend of international adoptions by Americans. Over the years, international adoptions increased and Americans went on to adopt more than 100,000 kids from South Korea, Romania, and elsewhere from 1953 to 1991. In 1992, China opened its orphanages to Americans and allowed them to take in thousands of girls abandoned because of the country's one-child policy. In recent years, though, international adoption has slowed to a trickle because of the changes abroad and within American adoption agencies. During the foreign adoption boom, most of the children adopted from abroad found happy homes in the U.S. Some, however, turned out not to really be orphans, but children instead placed in orphanages temporarily by their impoverished parents. And this sparked reforms and had a chilling effect on their home country's policies. Some of the most popular source countries for adoptable children, including Russia, Guatemala, and Ethiopia, shut down their adoption programs years ago because of the corruption, scandals, or tensions with the U.S. government. China expanded its domestic adoption program and reversed its one-child policy in 2015, dramatically reducing the number of girls who were relinquished for adoption. 
Right, so we've received this topic request a few times from adoptees themselves and people who are not adoptees but are curious. And one of the other questions that we got was, given the history that we just shared, um, or a brief synopsis of it, and the dynamics, is talking about international and transracial adoption problematic? And I want to say that talking about it isn't problematic as long as we acknowledge everything else, right? Like, as we said before, we want to include as many perspectives from the community and diaspora as possible, and that includes talking with Asian adoptees. On this podcast, we ask the question, how does your sewing connect to your identity? And from what we gather from the adoptees from Asian countries who have reached out to us, it's an intensely complicated question. So for example, one person has shared with us that they don't feel comfortable, uh, they don't feel connected to their Asian identity, sewing or otherwise, because their families did not incorporate their Asian ethnicity into their upbringing. But simultaneously, even though they don't feel connected to their Asian identity, they are confronted with all of the assumptions that looking like an Asian person comes with, including anti-Asian racism. And I think part of the reason why we haven't jumped on this idea is that some folks that we've spoken to who are Asian adoptees have shared that once this piece of their identity is revealed, people on social media, so internet strangers, have felt that it's appropriate to message them and ask them all sorts of really personal and invasive questions. And that's just wrong. Like, don't ask people personal and invasive questions if you don't know them, don't have that relationship with them, like they've set a boundary. Um, Or like, you know, there's this unspoken boundary, like don't ask people weird invasive questions on the internet. We don't want to put any of our guests in that type of situation. And at the same time, it's a really personal topic. And so some people might not be ready to talk about it on a podcast on the internet, because the internet is forever. And we are a podcast that's focused on the intersection between sewing and your identity. And so if if you are still working through that and kind of figuring out how you identify or what your identity is, I don't think it's appropriate for us to put you on the spot, right? Just because somebody wants is curious and wants to learn more, I think we should respect that and help you get to wherever you need to go um, in figuring that out. And and it, it is a journey and it's always kind of evolving. And so I think just purely interviewing people because they were adopted is, is it's not a good enough reason <laughs> to, yeah. to have that interview. I think maybe um, we will do some more research and, and better understanding of this and see like, if there are any sewists out there who are willing to talk about it, um, you know, raise your hand, let us know. We won't know. Um, But we will be kind of thinking about it further and talking about it amongst the group. And I think any guests that we do have, they're going to have to say, yes, I would like to talk about it. Because some of the folks that have submitted, you know, this is a topic who are adoptees themselves have said, I'm not ready to talk about it, but I'd like to hear someone else talk about it. And so far, uh, we haven't had anyone. And so, you know, don't go to your Asian adoptee friends and say, hey, this is podcast, like you should be on it, like maybe let them know. But, you know, don't try to force anyone to contact us to be a guest, I think. Um, But if you are, if you do, if you are an Asian adoptee, and, and you might be interested in sharing your story, definitely, definitely get a hold of us. So those were the two big topic suggestions that we got this season, multiple times from multiple different people. And some of the other topic suggestions we received were requests to do deep dives on specific garments, self-nominations to be guests, both of which, again, we very much welcome. And as we said earlier, when we covered our process, we conduct research and look for guests and topics that we want to work on, but we're definitely not able to find everything uh, on our own. So if you have a good idea or topic, again, just send us an email. That's Asian Sewist Collective at gmail.com. To sum up this part of today's episode, if the topics of being mixed race or an Asian adoptee appeal to you, resonate with you, and you're interested in being a guest on our podcast or know someone who is, let us know. A guest doesn't have to record an entire episode if they don't want to. We can do shorter interviews like we did for episode 19, where we covered the history of the sari before we spoke to two guests about their relationship with the garment. We also got feedback, like I said earlier, regarding specific episodes that were released that we wanted to share. So Amelia of at Amelia underscore two underscore Nuno. So E-M-I-L-I-A underscore T-O 
underscore N-O, N-U-N-O on Instagram shared this feedback with us ap- after episode 17 aired, which was about imposter syndrome in sewing. Note that we adjusted their feedback slightly for clarity. So they said, I liked it and I love the two perspectives. On one hand, as a person with various mental disorders, I think we should not underplay it, but I'm also very strong and direct and can relate to someone who has to achieve everything themse- but themselves. Personally, I would not have ventured into psycho- into the psychological part as in the discipline of psychology and kept it to personal opinions. I have a psychiatry background and felt like it would have been better to state that personal opinions were being shared and also to say something along the lines of we are simplifying concepts greatly, talk to a therapist, etc. I really do like the podcast. Honestly, it's not pulling any punches. I think the tone may have come across as a bit dismissive at times, though not intentionally. We are all human and you already cover so many important topics. The intention is always good on your part. What the podcast said on race and class and other isms making what seems to be imposter syndrome manifest was totally valid, but I would have to maybe said that for people with mental health issues and or mental disorders, you can't just snap out of it once you realize class and race play a role. And thank you, Amelia, for writing in. The collective often shares podcast feedback within the team, and we discuss the best the way the best way to move forward as a team. And the producer for this episode, Mariko, had some thoughts in response to this that we wanted to surface today. She processed Amelia's words and felt that the scripts episode should have said in a more definite manner that although we touched upon the psychology aspect of imposter syndrome or its lack thereof, we barely scratched the surface, so any listeners who wanted to learn more should consult with a mental health professional. Mariko says that we had some great disclaimers in episode two, our interview with Angelica Creates, that coincided with Mental Health Awareness Month that should have also been included in this episode. She did want to point out that Cindy, our researcher in this episode, has an academic background in psychology and dug through old textbooks to find the information that we needed. And Mariko also felt that Amelia's points on folks with pre-existing mental disorders finding it difficult to snap out of feeling imposter syndrome, even upon learning that it can manifest due to all of the isms, is totally true. Imposter syndrome may not be classed as a psychological disorder, but that doesn't make it any easier to resolve. And for those wondering why our producers weighing in, our producers play a key role in the creation of an episode. They decide the direction an episode goes, do a lot of the coordination work with the researcher and the co-hosts, write the scripts Ada and I read through during recording, and are highly involved during and after recording. They're like the director or the invisible hand kind of guiding me and Nicole. And even though their voices aren't always heard on the podcast, they play the biggest role in actually getting this off the door. And so I wanted to thank you for sharing some uh, information on that, Nicole. And I wanted to throw in my two cents regarding Amelia's feedback. I think we did our best to communicate that we did research for the episode, but as Amelia points out, we are no, we are not mental health professionals and we're not qualified to be that. That's not what either of us studied. Um, If you are in need to, talk to somebody or to find someone, um, I highly encourage you to do so. It has been a game changer for me. Um, It continues to be a game changer. I think that if you are having serious thoughts, there are resources out there um, that we will provide links to in the show notes. And if you're if you don't feel like you're there yet, maybe go back and listen to some of the episodes we've done on that, like episode two with Angelica Creates, um, but definitely advocate for yourself and talk to a mental health professional for sure. And as someone who has shared several times on the podcast that I have my own mental health issues, I have been diagnosed with depression and anxiety and seen a therapist. And I think this episode was particularly important for me because you could tell that I had this revelation about all the isms, you know, like, like, holy cow, this is, it's not just me feeling like shit and, and hating myself and uh, feeling inadequate or feeling like I am inadequate. And I think if it didn't, I do want to say just from my perspective that learning about, you know, the Harvard Business Review article that I don't think that it flipped a switch for me to say that, I can, as Amelia says, you know, snap out of it. I'm good. I don't have to struggle with imposter syndrome anymore. (laughs) Um, I still do. And so if we did not communicate that it's more nuanced than just 
understanding and, and flipping a switch and being able to recover from something that's, you know, not a, not a disorder, but clearly very impactful. You know, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to address it now. So we really appreciate your feedback, Amelia, and be sure to check them out at Amelia underscore two underscore Nuno on Instagram. Now, Next up, we got this email from Cynthia Park on her thoughts about body inclusivity and cultural appropriation. She writes, I have a series of interconnected thoughts that intersects two previous episodes about body inclusivity and cultural appropriation. I am a small, fat Korean American woman with a dream to wear a hanbok that I can put on without ripping any seams. My mom taught me, brought My mom brought back some traditional fabric that I am totally afraid of cutting into and gave me some of my grandma's handbox for me to copy the construction of. I am too fat and chesty for handbox patterns made by Korean pattern makers. My Korean language skills are too meager to interpret a garment making textbook for artisans or a virtual class taught in Korean. And I really want to learn how to make this amazing garment that has been previously inaccessible to me because of size constraints. I even thought about finding a handbok maker in my community and bringing in the fabric my mother purchased, but the fear of being chastised for being fat is a real obstacle in following through on that one. Making the muslin of the jacket gives me all the feels, my internalized fat phobia, feelings of cultural appropriation, a deep appreciation for my mom and culture. I'm not asking for, uh, I'm not at all asking for you to tell me what to do, but I want to share these thoughts as a listener. Thank you for creating this needed space in the sewing community, Cynthia. So my thoughts first are, you know, Cynthia, thank you so much for writing in. And as someone who would probably be considered small fat as well, and having faced a lot of external fat phobia growing up in my Filipino community, I can completely relate to your feelings about constructing this cultural garment, uh, uh, you know, your cultural garment in the way that I've constructed mine in recent years. And I don't have advice. You didn't ask for advice. I don't have any, but I want to offer some encouragement and to say that I am really proud of you for getting out there and trying, you know, to to connect with this part of your heritage. I know that it's scary. Nobody wants to hear all that bullshit that people put on us growing up. Um, I still don't want to hear it. And I'm, you know, like, like in my mid thirties and I'm just like, I can't, I don't want that in my life, but I really hope that, you know, you are able to make this work for yourself. Use some of the beautiful heritage items that your mom was able to give you. And, uh, I, I can't wait to see what you have coming up. I just, when I read your email, I, if you could replace the words Filipino and, you know, Turno or any type of Filipino clothing in there. And all of it seems really relatable. So just know that I am rooting for you and I can't wait to see uh, what you do next. Yeah, I actually responded to Cynthia when the email first came in and I was like, oh my gosh, have you seen this TikToker (laughs) who goes by at Asian Snow White on TikTok? Also, we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. Um, I believe she's a also a fat Korean American woman who um, identifies as fat and then it actually makes hanbok for people to wear for herself and and is trying to be more size inclusive of this the garment and the style. Um, and I just came, I don't know how I got recommended her on TikTok, <laughs> but um, I seem to get a lot of random videos on TikTok of all sorts of different Asians and um she she has a lot of choice words to say um about body image and inclusivity and appropriation and so I sent that along I hope it was helpful I just reading this email I it kind of made my heart ache a little bit um I'm not bad um, I do not necessarily struggle with the same struggles that, that Cynthia shared with us. Um, and the closest I can relate to is that like, you know, when you go to Asia and there's like quote unquote one size, um, clothing at the night markets and stuff. And, you know, back in high school, I might've been able to <laughs> fit into those, um, and, and maybe was on the larger end of those, but now like there's 
no way unless it's literally just like a piece of fabric a tube top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah not even like not even like it might not even stretch enough and um again i am i'm not fat i am i'm like somewhere in the mid range of of a lot of pattern designers um at least on their straight size sizing um so even just a smaller when you consider like complete sizing ranges um from like zero to 40 and so i uh, it just yeah it just made my heart ache that all of this is kind of going on i do hope that we can kind of cover some of these intersections of topics in future um future episodes and i i do know from speaking to some korean american friends that like this is and relatives that this is like a thing it's it's um very much very much a uh culturally perpetuated issue um and so it can't necessarily just be solved by like if you were to figure out how to make a hanbok which i think would be great um that doesn't necessarily solve the larger issues and i I think um it solves it solves the immediate need of of the garment right um but I can also tell you that um, as somebody who studied Korean for four years in college and has a, has a whole minor in it and paid a lot of money for that minor, my language skills are also not good enough to interpret a textbook or artisans. And so I, I, I sense that you were being a little hard on yourself for your language skills. And I think perhaps a lot of us who are second generation um, uh, feel that way about our language skills sometimes. And I don't think that's any reason to feel like you can't access your culture. Um, I I have one more thing I do want to add, and and this is going to come across as advice. So prepare yourselves, everyone. Um, <laughs> but this is this is for Cynthia, but this is for anyone listening. You know, I have read this email. I reviewed it before um, we came on, and reading it aloud again, and hearing you say that you're too fat. Or your two me- your language skills are too meager. Several years ago, I read something. I don't even know what it was. It could have been an Instagram like carousel. And you know, Ada, you pointed out it sounds like she's being too hard on yourself. The word "too" t o o is a a fixture of people's language that can, if you can completely eliminate it from your daily use and the way that you think about yourself, it can make a really big difference in how, you know, you think about yourself. So the implicate, and it's a lot of times, and I remember this article said, the word too is often applied to describe women. They are too fat. They're too skinny. They're too loud or they're too quiet. They're too shy. They're too bossy. They're too smart. Um, So the word too embedded into it, however you apply it, is that you are not you are not what you are supposed what you are not what I think you are supposed to be. So when we say I'm too fat, you know, for who? Um, and uh, you know, like by whose standards? And yeah, we can name lots of people. But something that's helped me a lot is that I've really tried to eliminate calling myself to anything. Um, and I made this conscious choice a few years ago. And I usually when I say, and I'm not perfect, it's not like I don't do that, but like that I don't say I'm too blah, blah, blah. Often it's I'm too tired. That's like, the, that's like how yeah. I use the word too. But I don't, I try not to say, you know, like I'm too fat for these pants. I'm like, well, these pants, pants don't fit me anymore. <laughs> like, And if you sit and think about, you're describing the same thing, but instead of using I'm too fat, you're saying that the pants it's not me that's wrong. It's not me that's inadequate or or overadequate. Like it's the pants. And so just reading, I'm too fat. My skills are too meager. Like be kinder to yourself and think about that word. Think about the word too. And and see if you can start thinking differently if you find yourself wanting to describe yourself as too anything. And um see what that does for you. I think it was a really big mindset shift. And I remember talking to Jennifer on episode 15 that I'm garbage at mindset shifting, but that's one that really, uh, really changed things for me. So now that I'm done preaching, (laughs) (laughs) 
the, ne- the next piece of feedback that we wanted to share was on multiculturalism in Guyana. So we received some really neat information from a listener, Michelle, who is at Mimi FXRD. So that at, that's at M-I-M-I-F-X-R-D on Instagram. And episode 19 was a deep dive on the sari, a popular traditional garment of people from the Indian subcontinent. And it was such a great episode. I learned so much while we worked on it. And I have such a better appreciation, I think, for beautiful garments and the fabric and so we put a call out on instagram the week the episode aired ag- asking us or bleh, asking people to tag us in their sorry makes and so that's when we received a response from michelle and she shared a beautiful bright pink jumpsuit that she made from sorry fabric which she said she made for a quote east meets west quote end quote vibe which we will clarify in just a second and so you can head to her instagram to see the suit it was posted on november 20th 2021 and it is a vintage butterick pattern number 6454 and she hacked it to have a wide leg and pockets so it has a halter front it's solid pink except for the detail around the cuff of the wide leg pant that is in a beautiful black and gold trim. We wanted to highlight this make because Michelle shared some really interesting and new to us information about the country that she lives in, which is Guyana. Guyana is a country in South America's North Atlantic coast situated between Venezuela and Suriname. And when she shared her beautiful sari fabric jumpsuit, Michelle also mentioned that Guyana is home to a high concentration of, of people of Indian descent. And that Guyana is truly a multicultural society where citizens celebrate and share in their traditions. Those were her exact words. And as an example, she said that Diwali, which is the festival of lights widely celebrated throughout the Indian subcontinent and by members of its diaspora, is a national holiday in Guyana as well. And according to Michelle, the Indian Guyanese population in Guyana is due to the practice of indentured servitude. So she shared that between 1838 and 1917, over 500 ship voyages were made from India to Guyana, carrying nearly 240,000 indentured Indian people. And so FYI, indentured servitude is the practice of recruiting people to travel to another country, paying for the cost of the travel and lodging when they get there. And then the people work to pay off that debt rather than actually getting paid in money or a wage. And this is ha- this is something that's been seen throughout US history as well. I'm thinking of the indentured like Chinese population and mm-hmm. was it the mid to late 1800s built um, the railroads primarily on the west coast that eventually led to the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1865. So Google that if you've not heard of it. This um, is not to skip over enslaved people in which the US robbed an entire continent of its people. Yes. And there's a lot of history there, um, but we we're not going to unpack that. Today. Yeah, I I, yeah. I want to because it's because I I looked into it. You know, like why we moved to indentured servitude mm-hmm. following the you know freeing quote unquote of enslaved people. So um, I don't know why I said quote unquote the freeing of enslaved people in the United States moved to indentured servitude. There's a lot of reasons for that and the similar reasons in Guyana. So let's, we'll go back. We'll focus on Guyana. I think that for me, just receiving this feedback and going down a rabbit hole of learning a little bit more about Guyana helped me also better reflect on some of the United States history as well. Um, So Michelle, she says that she does not have Indian ancestry, but that she is of Black, Chinese, and European descent, and further explained that the Chinese arrived in Guyana via indentured servitude as well. Michelle also lets us know that Guyana's ethnic makeup comprises of descendants of Amer Indians, American Indians, Africans, enslaved people who are brought to work on the plantations, Europeans, Spanish, French, Dutch and British colonizers, and then indentured laborers after the enslaved people were freed, Indians, Chinese, and Portuguese. So I don't know about you, Ada, but my knowledge of the country of Guyana was very limited before Michelle shared her make with us. And I really wanted to talk about it today and let our listeners know, because I think it's so neat how Guyana, a relatively small South American country, came to be so ethnically diverse with a significant Asian population in the descendants of the Chinese and uh, Indian indentured laborers. Yeah, when Michelle wrote in about her history and ancestry and, um, 
just her thoughts on the podcast so far, I was like, wow, A, our podcast has reached so far, but B, also there's so many other examples. Um, thanks, imperialism and colonialism and, and all the isms mm. um, <laughs> of countries where this is, there are similar cases. So like immediately what came to mind was Brazil has a massive Japanese population. Um, and the first time I met someone who was Japanese, but from Brazil was in high school um, cause she had also then moved to the U S and, or it was, it was weird, um, to be like, wait, what? Cause at that time you're like not really processing or you're like at a different point in forming your identity. And so like to see someone else who has a different identity is, is just so interesting. So, um, that came up, I think when we talked to, um, our guests for the sorry episode uh, some of that also came up as well um so i think of like southeast asian countries like indonesia and malaysia where there are different ethnic populations and different religions um coexisting proving that you can coexist um without perhaps some of the tension that we have here in the states um and I don't know. I thought it was interesting and it kind of makes me want to go down to another research rabbit hole to see what else we find. Um, Definitely we are looking into for season three and beyond how we can feature more people from all around the world with all different lived experiences and Mochi would agree. (laughs) Um, Just barking in the background that I, I'm someone who's always fascinated by learning from other people and learning about what their experience is like and not taking it as, you know, the only experience and, and um, saying that that person represents everybody and Mochi again agrees, but um, I'm just really looking forward to learning more about different people and where they come from and different cultures and heritages and how all of that identity, the identity work, to be honest. Um, intersects with our shared sewing practice. And I apologize for my very talkative dog today. Leave it all in. That's great. <laughs> so thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing your feedback and being a, being a listener. Check her out at Mimi FXRD. That's M-I-M-I FXRD on Instagram. <laughs> Love it. He's just, he keeps on going. (laughs) Energizer bunny. (laughs) That's great. Thank you so much for joining us on our inaugural mailbag episode. We are officially in the off season, but all of our episodes are available to download wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find all of our episodes up on our YouTube channel. Just search for Asian Sewist Collective and you'll find uh, audio only versions for season one and full videos for season two. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and will allow us to give back to our all-volunteer team who works so hard to provide you with new content each week. The link to our Coffee page is ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewist Collective. And you can find the link in our show notes on our website and on our Instagram account. Check us out on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. You can also help us out by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And again, don't forget to check us out on YouTube and our website at AsianSewistCollective.com. You can find all of the links and resources mentioned for all of our episodes on the website, as well as a directory of Asian-owned sewing businesses and anti-racism resources. Again, it's all on our website at AsianSewistCollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Like we said for the entire episode, email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on a future episode at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts, Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline, and this episode was produced and edited by our superstar production and editing team, Mariko Abe and Henry Wong. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this season's podcast a reality. Oh, I forgot the last line because it's kind of on the page. <laughs> I was like, is she going to say it? <laughs> it's because we swapped.
This is the Asian Sewist Collective podcast, and we'll see you next season for real this time.